Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Patrick. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is September 9th, 2002. Uh, um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I should probably start off by saying that uh, I have, uh, apparently I have very um, offensive experience, strength, and hope. <laughs> so just, just to let you know, I'll know when it, I'll let you know when it gets offensive. <laughs> so, so um, but, um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I'm pretty, you know, uh, it's funny about Jerry. Um, he, uh, he has a, he has a circuit speaker as his sponsor. Uh, he spends like eight hours every Sunday taking people through fist steps. He started a group at a treatment center and, um, you know, he does, you know, he, he pretty much every waking hour is an AA or, um, that he's not at work and, um, and he calls me hardcore. So I kind of like wear that as a badge of courage <laughs> of honor, excuse me. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of, uh, funny when that guy calls you hardcore. So I, I, you know, um, uh, kind of, um, a relish in that. <laughs> um, and so let's, let's kind of learn how I, I became hardcore. Um, <laughs> um, uh, basically, uh, when I was young, um, my parents, I, I came from a broken home. My, my parents, uh, divorced when I was really young. My mom just, uh, she wasn't, um, capable at the time of, um, of really taking care of me and my brother. She just didn't, know how she had, you know, mental illness. Um, and so whenever my dad initially divorced, uh, from her, he wanted her to have custody, but she just, you know, wasn't, um, capable, um, uh, of, of being a a good mother at the time. Um, she was later, but (laughs) talk about that. Um, but, um, so my dad ended up taking custody and and he's like a child of the fifties kind of thing. And, and he just, um, he quickly turned around and found somebody kind of to, to, to remarry and, and kind of raise me and my brother. The problem was is he kind of just kind of threw it on his new wife and kind of put a lot of expectation on her, you know, cause he would go make the money and, and, you know, and the expectation is, is you just take care of these sick kids, you know? Um, and she had two kids of her own. Um, and, uh, long story short, she, she basically was very, very, uh, physically abusive towards me and my brother. Um, it was, you know, one of the, um, worst cases of child abuse, um, reported in St. Tammany Parish, um, at the time. Um, and, um, her son, you know, ended up, uh, also like sexually abusing me and my brother. And, um, and my dad never found out about it until the divorce. Um, and, you know, it was really hard on him and, and he, um, tried church for a little bit, um, and he found, cause he found a girlfriend <laughs> in church. And, um, so this is marriage number four, I think, <laughs> uh, no, but, um, you know, so I discovered alcohol pretty young, um, because, you know, I, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin, um, because people were trying to beat me out of it, uh, <laughs> a lot, as you might imagine. So, um, I, uh, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And, and when I first I took my first drink, um, you know, there's a line out of the book that talks about the real alcoholic and it kind of goes through a checklist of, of symptoms. And it says he's a real Jekyll and Hyde type. And, and when I read that, I, I look at that and, and I see that I, I, there were two different people. There was a person I really enjoyed being whenever I was drinking. Um, I, it was an escape for me. I got to be who I couldn't be whenever I was sober. I was just locked up kid, but you give me, you give me just, you know, my first drink and, and I become funnier. I become, you know, um, uh, my problems just kind of shrink as, as soon as I, I, and I learned very early on that I could, you know, just any problem I had could just be numbed. Um, 
through drinking. And um, my friends just really also liked this person, like we call him like Drunk Pat. You know, it was like the version of of me that that they really enjoyed. Um, and um, it, you know, they, they asked me to join their fraternity. <laughs> um, so I did. You know, um, I did pretty well in high school. Uh, towards the end, I didn't do it good my first two years, but then I moved away and went to another school. Um, I was picked on a lot at my first school. It was like a preppy, you know, kind of ritzy neighborhood. Then I moved to like, moved in with my mom my senior year and it was kind of a lower um, uh, economic level high school and I fit in more <laughs> more with the, the lower economically scaled uh, drunks and <laughs> um, guys at that level and, and uh, my grades just kind of shot up and I was able to get into LSU from there and I joined the Army National Guard um, and it's a pay for school um, and my mom had a baby uh, when I was 19 um, works for Jared and she like I remember going to visit him in the hospital and he and she's holding him and uh She's like, I got a second chance, you know, <laughs> and uh, she took it. She took advantage. I mean, he's a, a Eagle Scout. Uh, he's a really bright kid. Um, Jerry thanks me for bringing him to him because he's a good, good worker, good kid. Um, somehow, <laughs> um, probably because I got sober. I'm sure. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, gave him some good Christmases, but he's a, uh, a great kid. So I have a brother that's 19 years younger. And uh, but anyway. Um, um, my drinking kind of took off. I, I got into LSU, and um, my drinking kind of. I always drank. I, I always drank to excess, but I just thought that I was just drinking people under the table. You know, um, the idea that that you could just have two and be fine was just always crazy to me. It was like I, I never drank for taste. I, I didn't like the taste. I, I drank for effect always, um, and I I, I basically. Um, because of the National Guard, um, I basically didn't get too much into drugs um, because, I mean, I, I got drug tested. And, you know, I just, uh, I, liquor, alcohol was just easier for me. It was just, you know, alcohol never left you, let you down, you know. As Earl Hightower says, you know, it never let me down. You know, <laughs> I always knew where to get it. You know, it wasn't, you know, uh, I didn't have to wait in the parking lots and, you know, worry about uh, getting arrested and all that stuff. So uh, I stuck pretty much to alcohol. Um, and it worked well um, for a while. Um, it, it got me through my my uh, initial adolescence um, with, you know, you know, uh, relationships. And, uh, you know, I had... Um, Clarence Snyder used to say that um, alcoholics don't think they emote, and my emotions are always, you know, ex I'm an extremist in my emotions, and um, and so I'm either, you know, when I got into relationships, I'd love them to death and, and hate them to death whenever they, you know, um, they didn't respond in kind to me, uh, <laughs> and I would, you know... Um, I remember when I started to, I dropped out of college and I thought I could just move away from my problems because my brother, my older brother ended up becoming like a schizophrenic. Um, it usually gets diagnosed whenever they're in their twenties and started having episodes and, and then he had to come live with me and I'm sitting here with four college roommates and just like, yeah, that's my brother. He's sleeping on the, <laughs> on the floor and, and I couldn't de deal with it. I couldn't handle it. And I was drinking, started, really started to drink daily from that. And then I was like, well, I'll just move to Utah because I got an old girlfriend there who became Mormon. And, um, I couldn't talk her out of that for some reason <laughs> when I got out there, <laughs> but I stayed there for a year and, um, I was drinking every day from that point. And I decided, you know, um, I just couldn't live like that anymore, and I came back to Baton Rouge, and the fraternity that I had joined <clears throat> at LSU, they had a room, and they were like, oh, you know, you can rent this room for 200 bucks a month, and, you know, and I could afford that, so I moved in with them with the intention that, you know, this is, um, th you know, to go back to school. And like two days after I arrived, like September 11th happens. <laughs> so um, not that that was... Um, but, uh, so the, the idea was is that I was going to go just walk on campus. I'm living there and just go walk and go to the register, you know, the register's office and register for school. And I just couldn't get 
I just started to just really just, I couldn't move anymore. I was like, I had, I was pretty much by Brian Wilson only without the money. <laughs> like I just wanted to lay in bed and just, you know, I would just get up. The only reason why I, you know, I would get out of bed is just to go get some money so I could get some more alcohol kind of thing. And, and, um, I was waiting tables and my life was just nowhere. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was just living, um, I was just living in a, in, in a room and just drinking every day and wanting to die. Um, and I, I spiraled out of control pretty much from there. Um, pretty quickly to a point where people were in, when you're in a fraternity house and people say you need to get help, um, <laughs> you know, you're pretty bad, you know, um, I like, you know, what's funny is like, you can always tell when you're kind of like there, whenever you tell people that you're initially, you know, you go tell people that you're in a recovery and they can do this. Whew, thank God. <laughs> you're like, why didn't you tell me that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, we were going to say something <laughs> kind of thing. But, um, yeah, and so I uh, I got to, so spring semester comes around. I'm not registered. I can't go on campus. Can't be registered. I don't know what I want to do, and I just got to stop this drinking. I got to get my life together. Summer rolls around. I'm not in school, so I'm uh, there. Here comes a year coming up, and I'm just like wanting to kill myself. I'm like I I'm stuck in this dead end job. I, I can't. I don't even have a driver's license, like a, a valid driver's license. I don't have insurance on my car. I don't have just normal things that a normal person has. Like I'm just completely just like people are walking around my room because it smells, you know, it's just like, uh, I'm just pitiful, <laughs> incomprehensible, demoralized, demoralized at that point. And I, I, um, I just wanted to die. And I got a phone call from somebody who had heard from my old hometown in, in Mandeville. And his mom was a therapist. He was like, why don't you come out here and come, come, come stay for a day or two or whatever. And I got out there and I talked to his mom and I'm like, look, I, I'm just, I think I'm just really depressed and I just need to get on some medication. I'm just drinking every day and I can't stop. And I'm just breaking down with this woman. And she's like, well, here, here's a um, number to Baton Rouge uh, mental health. Um, give them a call. And, you know, they'll, they'll work with you and get you some medication. And, um, and it took me, of course, a few weeks to call, you know, <laughs> to get up to call the call. And I, I call and I, I start, um, going over the checklist, you know, and, and she's like, well, how often do you drink? And I said to her, um, well, I'm self-medicating, you know, so just, you know, I don't know, three times a week, <laughs> you know, and I didn't know that three times was abnormal. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I thought that three times was just like excessive. But I didn't realize, like, I heard a statistic, like, the normal, an average adult, American adult, like, it's drunk, like, two or three times a year at most. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so I told her three times a week, and the lady on the other phone, on the other line, and goes, Honey, you need to call substance abuse. I'm like, will they give me drugs? <laughs> will they give me some some uh, depressants, <laughs> antidepressants or something? And she's like, yeah, you just you probably have to go through their um, their treatment there. And and I'm like, substance abuse. All right, because um, I didn't think that alcohol was my problem. Um, uh, I thought it was. Uh, I thought. Um, and it's funny today that I, that I look at it because I didn't know, I didn't think I was an alcoholic for two reasons. Because I was drinking beer every day. Um, and the second reason was because I felt like I was self-medicating. And what's funny today is like, those are the only two reasons that make me an alcoholic. <laughs> right? Those are the two reasons because I was drinking beer every day because I had so little control over the amount I took. That if I drank hard liquor, I would black out. I never bought a fifth of liquor in my life and didn't drink the whole thing. In fact, I can walk over to a friend's house and I can see like a fourth of a bottle of liquor and just laugh and giggle like, who's, who's that for? You know, <laughs> what is that going to do for you? You know, you got like a fourth left. Who, I mean, who would leave a fourth <laughs> of liquor left in that bottle? <laughs> it's amazing to me. Um, but I drank beer because it was my only means of controlling. And I see women, you know, I tell people all the time, I see women do that with wine, you know, women, women female alcoholics do that all the time. It's the only, the only way I could really control it because I could start drinking beer and I can drink all night. And, um, 
I, and I talked about like how my, my emotions were extreme. It's like I could be yelling at a TV one night and the next night I could be crying myself to sleep. Like it was just like insane. Um, the emotional uh, balance I had <laughs> um, at the time and still today. <laughs> um, and I just um, I need to realize where I was. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I called the the the, the substance abuse, and um, I talked to them and and got into their day treatment program. And, um, oh, the other reason why I was an alcoholic, um, uh, the self-medication thing. Uh, it's really cheaper to go see a doctor and get on antidepressants than it is to, like, afford a case of night beer habit, just FYI. Um, and most people, um, they, whenever they list the uh, next time you see a commercial for antidepressants, watch, they don't talk about um do you drink yourself to, to to sleep every night, crying or yelling at TVs? <laughs> they don't. They don't normally. That's not one of the side effects of depression. And I'm not saying that um, depression isn't a part of it. I'm just saying that I don't think that depression causes alcoholism. I think alcoholism causes depression. Um, <clears throat> but um, in any case, I had it backwards. Um, but I drank because. Um, a, you know, Clancy says that, you know, A is not for people whose problem is alcohol. A is for people whose solution was alcohol. And that's why I was drinking. And that's what made me, you know, made me an alcoholic. Um, that was the, the, the caveat. That was the difference. And so, like I said, um, the fact that I thought I was self-medicating is why, is what makes me an alcoholic. Now, I'll get back to it. <laughs> uh, so I go to this um, day, day treatment program and kind of like the literally the first person I meet, in the, who's pretty much the first sober member of AA I, I came across. This guy, he had had um, another DUI, and he got was proactive this time. He had, you know, been in, he got sober for like five months, and then he got sentenced to treatment. And so he already had five months whenever he's starting in this treatment with me. Um, and he had been in and out of the rooms a few times, and we got our first break. And um, he pulls me aside, and he's like, do you want to survive this? And I'm like, yeah. He says, um, when you get to AA, get you one of them sponsors. Find you a sponsor who's had a spiritual experience as a result of the steps. And uh, this crackhead girl was, like, sitting on the bench, and she goes, yeah, they call them big book thumpers. <laughs> and they're not, they're not really easy that easy to find. And I was like, hmm. I didn't know what she was talking about, and you know, what they were talking about at first, and it just it was one of those things, like, it happens, and it's just, like, you put it in the back of your head. Just, oh, okay. And um, this is 2002, and, uh, you know, AA was different. Uh, um, AA was not, it was pre-Joe and Charlie explosion kind of thing. Um, there weren't many big book studies. There weren't many step studies. Um, there was a lot of open discussion. Um a lot of um, talk of waiting to do the steps. There were people saying, work a step a year, wait till, you know, you have a year to do the step. Or, you know, um, I don't, you know, uh, it was kind of one of those, it was, <laughs> it, it's one of those things like, if you're like a conspiracy theorist, you think like maybe, you know, the treatment centers have come in and we're seeing 75% success and you're like, let's tell them not to do the steps. <laughs> so that we can, we can get some repeat customers, you know, <laughs> so it's like, um, so it was, it was, it was hard to watch, you know, and people like, Sometimes, you know, we get into to, to scrap, scraps with uh, folks who, who are probably very well-intentioned even today um, who don't understand who weren't there and saw how people were. Um, it's like basically going to a group meeting was like sitting with a bunch of five-year-olds um, because no one was working steps. And so, I mean, you literally, like this one's dating that one, and then they broke up, so they have to split up their meetings, and then this one said something about their relationship that gets back to this one and, and you have two old timers one's going to share and then the other one's going to sh- crap on whatever he said you could say this guy is blue and the, they'd fight and it was just like you know people who just hadn't matured emotionally in, in any way because they don't really understand how to do steps very well um and um 
but I, I flourished in, in that <laughs> at first. Um, I was, you know, going to meetings every day and I was doing that thing where I would go to the meetings and I'd hear something really good and then I would regurgitate it back at the next meeting if I didn't see the person who said it. And I knew how to catch the good stuff and regurgitate the good stuff back to you. And, and so it looked, and I looked and sounded like I was getting this thing in it. In it. But, it was, <laughs> um, and my first three months I was, I was, you know, coasting, you know, but I was starting to grow a little bit spiritually too. Um, I had tried some prayer and some meditation and some, saw some, some results from that. And so I started to grow a little bit spiritually and, it, and there's a line after the third step that says that, um, you know, we, we might feel, uh, an effect, sometimes a great effect can be felt at once, but it, it basically will go away is what it, what it, what it amounts to. And I'm, I'm losing track of exactly the wording, but, it, but it basically says that it's temporary. And I didn't understand that. You know, I thought that this slight little jolt I got spiritually from the third step prayer, you know, was going to last and that, that I could build, um, a strong foundation just on that. And I started after about three months, I started to, you know, get a little bit sick, but I didn't really know it, you know, kind of thing. And I decided like, oh, I'll go to Mount Mardi Gras <laughs> with my friends. And, um, I, uh, I had like really my first, Obsession, my first desire to really relapse and drink. I went to Mardi Gras and just saw, I was just, you know, I told myself that lie that we all do, like, oh, no, I don't miss it. I don't miss it at all. And then I'm just sitting there just watching these guys just hit, get hammered and I'm just like, whoa, what's that? And, um, and I didn't have, I, 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 I didn't drive, so I didn't have a ride. And, uh, so I, I didn't know what to do. So I, the, the only thing I th- could think to do was go in the back of this U-Haul where they had all these kegs and I like got on my knees over a keg and, you know, um, just ask God for help. And, um, you know, five minutes later, this girl's like gets in a fight with her boyfriend. She's like, I'm leaving. I'm going back to that room. I'm like, Hey, <laughs> uh, so I, you know, God showed up for me there. <laughs> so I, I catch a ride back to, uh, right to the clubhouse and my, um, my sponsor was there. And I was like, hey, I think there's a problem. I think I should do that fourth step, step thing. And he's like, you're not ready. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean I'm not ready? So it took me about two weeks to convince him that I was ready to, to, to do a fourth step. And he told me what to write. He told me to write, you know, this out of the book. And, and, um, I'm ready to, um, we, we, we scheduled to meet on that Sunday. And, um, like it was a Wednesday night meeting. We decided to go to this Wednesday night meeting, like at 10 o'clock together. And these two guys show up there, one with the leather bound big book, and he's there with an, uh, another guy. And uh, the guy with the leather bound book had 20 years, and the other guy had 10. And, and it was a first step meeting, and I had about five, four or five months at this time. It was a first step meeting. And back then, a first step meeting was, um, was torturous because it was either a, um, a first step meeting always turned into either a, a drunk log meeting where people would tell you, you know, start out Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill, and <laughs> ended up, ended up rubbing alcohol with, uh, with moonshine. And you're like, I didn't do that. <laughs> and, uh, um, or it was a war story meeting. And, um, which was, um, which was interesting sometimes. Um, but everyone has the same war story. He's been around for a while, you know, it's like the, the war started and really change. And so it, it could be real interesting at first, but then you realize, well, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> um, why you need to tell us about your three DUIs or, or the job you lost. Um, and, um, these two guys, when it was their turn to share, um, everybody was doing the war story thing and, um, it was these two guys to share. And the first guy shared and he talked about, um, and Matt, you know, he says, he said the book, you know, in the book, it says, if you're not sure if you're not alcoholic, you should try some controlled drinking, but you can actually think about controlled drinking. And he said, imagine the calendar and it's Friday night and you come over to my house and I, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I offer you two beers and then stop. And then Sunday, Saturday nights, college football games, all I come over, you have a glass of tequila and a half a pump and stop and then go home and don't and by the time he got to Sunday, I'm already giggling, you know, it's just, <laughs> there's no way who would do that, you know? And, um, the second guy shared, um, something about, um, uh, um, 
another way to tell if you're an alcoholic. And I just sat there thinking, wow, holy crap, what the hell? And I didn't know for years what it was. And you know what it was? These two guys in a first step meeting actually followed the fifth tradition. They actually shared something that was actually trying to help another alcoholic. And I remember sitting there just for year, for, for months, just like in a first step meeting and just rolling my eyes, just thinking, um, uh, the only thing I really wanted to know whenever I was a newcomer was, was I an alcoholic and how do you tell? And so when I'm in a first step meeting, that's what I do is I tell you how you tell if you're an alcoholic. I don't really want to go <laughs> and tell you about, you know, how many, you know, how many jobs I lost or any of that stuff. That's all I wanted to know. And that's what I do now. And, um, you know, I thank those guys for, for doing that, you know? Um, but you know, so anyway, I, I, my first thought was, you know, there weren't many people who knew how to do any kind of step work and these two guys. So I ran out after the meeting and made sure I introduced myself and the big guy said his name's Dave and he always said his name's Tony. And, um, he said, I said, I asked him, I said, it sounds like you guys really know some stuff about the steps. And he looks, he looks around like this and he goes, kid, I got a freaking black belt in those steps. <laughs> and I started, it's like, oh my God, it's cool. So I made sure to get his number and he asked me what step I was on. And I said, um, I'm on step, um, we're about to do step five on, on Sunday. And you can see I was nervous and he told me the joke. You know, I don't know if it's appropriate, but <laughs> well, I'll tell you anyway. But, um, uh, the sponsor and sponsee are doing a fifth step together and the sponsee, you get to the end and the sponsor says, all right, what's the worst thing you ever did? The sponsor he looks down. He says, "You know, well, this one time I screw, screwed this chicken." And uh, the sponsor looks up at him and says, "Did yours die too?" You know. <laughs> and he said, and he said um, "You know, God, God's not going to put anybody in your life that can't hear your worst thing." And um, and I just kind of like this piece came over me, and I knew this guy just knew how to, uh, you know, he had something. I, and I remember he walked away, and I was just thinking, "How oh, was she?" <laughs> but I got this guy I picked. <laughs> I know it doesn't know this stuff as well as he does, but I'm just going to let him walk away. And because I already made my decision because I, I met this other guy who I saw at the meetings, you know, and, uh, and I know he doesn't know that what that guy does. We do that all the time. <laughs> I can't believe how many people do that. But, um, so I, I meet with this guy and I meet uh, and I show up with my two page, uh, inventory um, he told me to write the three columns out of the book and I, I read these three columns with him. I tell him the worst thing I did and I get a big hug and we go to a meeting and I felt nothing, you know, I just like, um, and after that, I think things just started to really go downhill. I started to become really dry. Um, cause he told me to go home and do, um, step six and seven on my own. And I, I remember I called him the next day and I said, what are these defects of character things that I'm supposed to be asking for? He's like, and he's like, uh, Oh, you know, like seven deadly sins or something. I'm like, we didn't talk about seven deadly sins. And, um, and I, I knew something was off. I was just like, um, and I started going to meetings and I would be okay. And then somebody would just mention drinking and I would just start to get, I just start to salivate. And I was just like, oh, can't wait till I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I was starting to plan my relapse in actively in meetings. Um, and I knew, um, I, I just started to notice how miserable most people in AA just seem to be. And, um, I, I just was like, is this, I can't, is this my life now? Is this what, with what AA is? I mean, I don't know if I can do this forever. You know, I don't know if I can sit in these rooms and just hear people bitch about, you know, what they're going through that day. And, and it's just like, so I started, I knew every, every fire of my being said I was wrong, you know, it was wrong. And I decided, you know, to move here to Atlanta and I had about six months and I bought a bus ticket and I had seven days, you know, before I was going to leave. And I was like, let me call that black belt. <laughs> and I, at that time, I didn't think, I thought that it took years to take the steps. And so I, I knew my, my first thought was there's nothing he can do to help me, but maybe he can just tell me something that will make me want to go to AA when I get to Atlanta. Because I'm a sober member here, I, I didn't want to relapse because everybody, I had that false uh, mask I was wearing, you know, and, and so I didn't want people to think that I was going to, you know, I didn't want people to know that I relapsed in, in Baton Rouge. I wanted to wait till I, you know, ego saved me there. <laughs> so um, I wanted to wait till I got to Atlanta. You know, I'm a sober member in Baton Rouge, but 
eh, you know, they don't know. <laughs> but um, so I knew I was wrong, and I just wanted this guy to convince me to stay in AA and that it gets better. And before I talked to him, actually, there was a guy who picked up a 20-year chip, and this old timer, and I had a lot of respect for him. He was one of those guys I stole a lot of those um, things in meetings, and I regurgitated them a lot. Um, and um, I really respected this guy, and I watched him pick up a 20-year chip, and I went up to him after the meeting in the clubhouse, and I said, um, so what's the secret? You know, I wanted him to tell me, you know, something. And he looks at me, <clears throat> he looked at me, and he said, um, um, you don't want to know the secret to long-term sobriety? Don't drink and don't die. Yeah. And um, I was like, okay. And then I was, you know, kind of waiting, like, um, okay. And then his sponsor, got a couple more years than he did, said next to him, he said, what do you think? He said, don't, yeah, don't drink and don't die. And I just remember, you know, they, it was a joke, I guess, but this feeling of dread just really fell over me. And I was just like, is this my life now? I mean, is this what I have to look forward to? Because these guys didn't exactly have what I wanted. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, I just, I was just like, is this all there is to AA? Um, and so when I talked to Dave, he agreed to meet with me that night. And um, and I told him, you know, I kind of just broke down. And I said, I don't know if I, I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can stay in AA. And, when I get there, and, and he said, well, what, what I can do for you is I can give you what's called an emergency surgery. I can take you through the first seven steps, and then, and then once you get settled in Atlanta. And, and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, we can go ahead and get this, remove this disease so you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I was like, that's crazy. And he said, what do you mean that's crazy? What do you mean? I said, they don't talk about that in AA? And he's like, no. It's like, God, the rooms are really gone, aren't they? And um, he quoted the 10-step promise to me. And he said that, that um, you know, um, the whole point of the program, and this is the first person to tell me this in six months, is to get the obsession removed. That's to have a spiritual experience that will remove your obsession to drink. And uh, I was like, oh, <laughs> I thought it was just to go to meetings every day and, and, and talk about your problems. <laughs> it was just group therapy. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so uh, he takes me to the, to the uh, parking lot, and he walks me through the first three steps. Um, right there in my car, and he had Tony pull up in their car and, and kind of like, you know, tag team me and just walk me right through the first three steps. Um, and he, he gave me five bucks and he said, you know, go into the CBS or whatever it was um, and buy, you know, a, a, a notebook and some pens. And he came out, I came out and he told me what to write. And he said, um, you, you know, show up on Friday. Well, we met on the uh, two nights later. We met up to go to a meeting, and he kind of told me his story. Um, and he said that, you know, he was a, a very smart guy. He had, like, a very high IQ. And he was, um, he got accepted to Northwestern University um, doctorate program. And um, he, you know, his drinking kind of destroyed that. He got married, and he told me that um, his, uh, him and his wife, we're drinking all the time and they got into a big fight and he got, and he left and he, and he came back and she had killed herself. And, um, I said, uh, I, I don't think I, I could ever get sober <laughs> from that. And, uh, I was like, how the hell are you here? And, uh, he said it was tough and he said he tried AA a few times <clears throat> and he said he got about six months. <clears throat> he got about six months the last time and he was about to leave like me. And, uh, he was in Baltimore. He was, uh, working for Britannica Encyclopedia at the time, and he said he was in Baltimore. And he walked into a meeting, and it was, a, you know, a lot of nonsense going on, like this guy sharing to impress this girl. And and he said that this guy had one arm, and he stood up, and he said, my name's Dewey McLaughlin, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm going to say what i got to say, and I don't give a F what you people think. And he's like, what? <laughs> and um, he said I, I asked him to sponsor me, and he said that... Um, um, Dewey took him through the steps and it saved his life. And um, Dewey ended up, uh, and this is kind of like, it was always kind of a funny side note. He was like, and Dewey's sponsor, you know, was uh, some guy in the book um, who was sponsored by some guy uh, named the uh, the home brewmeister, I believe, Clarence yeah. something. <laughs> and um, that, didn't, that wasn't significant to me until like a couple of years ago. I thought it was just one of those side things. Like, ah, yeah, one of the guys in the book. 
oh, not the Godfather of sponsorship and the, <laughs> the most successful sponsor in the history of the program. No, not that one. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, it, anyway, um, so I show up at his house on Friday night, and, uh, you know, I uh, he sits me down, and he just, you know, do a quick prayer, and uh, he says, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to never be angry again. Um, and, he, you know, he explained that this inventory, we're going to, you know, discover, the, you know, your dis- defective thinking. And if an alcoholic can't hold a resentment, he can't hold a drink. And, uh, and you know, he explained, like, if um, somebody tries to come into your house and, and kill you, you know, kill your family, you know, I would shoot them, you know, not be, but I don't have to do it because I'm angry. You can do it because it's the right thing to do, right? Somebody's trying to come after you like that. But, but you know, he kind of uh, explained it to me, and I'm like, come out with both barrels. I got my stepmom that, you know, abused me right off, you know, and and um, he tells me pull out a separate sheet of paper and write defects on top. And he's like, stepmom, um, where is she now? I'm like, I don't know. It's like, well, um, she, well, um, well, see, she doesn't have to live with it. You do, right? She could be worm food for all you know right now. You're the one that's carrying it, right? And so you're playing victim, right? And I, when he said that, it just, like, hit me sideways, like, holy crap. Because I can't tell you how many times right before I would take that drink, that, that thought would come to my head, just like, but if you had to deal with the stuff I had to deal with when I was a kid, you'd do what i do, you know? And it's just like, like that. I was a victim right there. And he's like, so you have to, this, uh, anyone who would do those things is, is obviously a sick person. You have to forgive them, you know, not for them, but for you, right? Because um, we, we forgive sick people so that we can be free. Um, and he, he, you know, and he just taught me how to think throughout, throughout the inventory. Every time that I, I was able to bring a resentment to him, he was able to show me that I was wrong in some way, that my thinking was defective in, in some form or fashion. And it reprogrammed me, you know, like with my parents, you know, playing God with mom and playing parent with parent, just like in, in every instance, he, he showed me every time that I was wrong in some way. And, um, you know, we, we, we hashed out the inventory and they would take turns. There were two of them. It was him and Tony. Um, and the book talks about, and Clarence talks about doing, uh, co-sponsorships and they were doing a co-sponsorship on me. And, um, <clears throat> So we hashed out this inventory, and they were like night owls, and so we stayed up like all night Saturday, and I have the bus leaving for Atlanta at Sunday at around noon, and um, so it's like the sun's just coming up Sunday morning, and we get to the end, and <clears throat> of the you know, he asked me my worst thing, and he laughed at me, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and uh, he had me read off the defects that he had been pulling out of all these resentments and, and my fears. And he asked, is there anything on that list you want to keep? He said, anything on the effing list you want to keep? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, you sure you don't want to be intolerant? And, uh, he had 154. They pulled. He was pretty good. Uh, Luke, <laughs> you have no idea how good this guy was. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and I was like, no. And he, he said he flipped open this old. Um, leather bound book and said read this prayer and I read that prayer three times and it was just like this <laughs> this feeling came over me like like I had been carrying a 50 pound weight and it just was like lifted off and I didn't even know I was carrying 50 pounds it was like wow holy crap and I was I got I got on this bus and it was like I was spiritually high like I was like ah. like this guy had just reprogrammed my brain to where there's a baby crying on the bus and, and I'm sitting here going, but it's a baby, babies cry, you know, it's just like, like, <laughs> you can't yell at a baby, it's just, <laughs> and I go to this meeting, when I get here, I go to the meeting, and I'm still high, it's a day later, and I'm still high, and, and people to this day remember me in that meeting, and this guy was like complaining about his problems, I'm like, you know, life ain't fair, but it's the only game in town, man, I just came here with a bag of freaking clothes, and you know, I just can't wait for the opportunity. <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> thanks for letting me share. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they wake up one day and they realize they don't have an obsession anymore. It was not my case. I was, it was gone like that. Um, 
um, I was, I was literally returned to sanity with it. You know? And, um, th- this is when my, my, uh, story gets offensive. Um, <laughs> because, um, most people don't have these types of experiences with the steps. And, um, you know, when you do, um, you get on fire about a, and that's when you become hardcore, Jerry, um, <laughs> is I became hardcore about it because, I mean, I started going to meetings and, and I was a, a fellowship guy before, but now I was going to fellowship and I was seeing people who were really hurting and who really needed a solution to their problems. And it didn't need to be told just to go to meetings anymore, to go to a lot of meetings. You know, before I would go and I'd hear people who were in terrible, terrible places asking, begging people in meetings to go to, for help and people would look at them and go, you know what? There's two more meetings today. Make sure you make both of them. And they had, it was like rubbed dirt on it, you know. So it was like they didn't have a solution for them, you know. They didn't. And um, and I'd say, hey, there's a way you don't have to live that way anymore, you know. There's a better way. And people get mad at me because they thought, you know, oh, you're going to push them out of the rooms, you know. You're you're you know you're telling them to go with work these steps and God, you know, I wasn't ready to work the steps is what I would hear. I'm sure Meredith heard it a lot too. I wasn't ready to work the steps and you're in the wrong place. I mean, God forbid, you know, in a fellowship meeting for people in a spiritual 12 step program that somebody gives in there and talks about God or steps. I mean, it's just, Oh, forgive me, (laughs) you know? And, um, so, uh, so I move here and I get a job and, uh, working, waiting tables, um, I buy a car in two months. I'm out of my dad's house in, in two months. I move in with this guy. I'm at a meeting and, um, this guy comes up the stairs one day and he's got, you know, he's got this look on his face. I could just tell he's untreated alcoholism. He just came from a meeting and he's doing this. I, and I know that look. And I say, I know somebody you could talk to. And I gave him the phone and he ends up driving to Baton Rouge and he comes back and he had the same experience I did. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> more offensive experience. <laughs> and, um, um, so then we carried the message together for a while, for five years. Uh, we started co-sponsoring people and sometimes they'd have the same experience as us. Sometimes they didn't. Um, and sometimes they stay sober. Sometimes they didn't. Um, but we did have people who did stay sober, um, um, by doing it. Um, and it's not a guarantee. I think, you know, part of it is, is, um, just the speed at which, um, we were doing it. Um, you know, looking back today, uh, it's, uh, I tell people all the time, just because it happened to me, it doesn't mean it's going to happen for you the same way, but it doesn't mean that your experience is any less than mine. Um, because, you know, you know, the guy that, uh, I was carrying his message was he didn't stay sober, um, after five years and, you know, he, he, for various reasons, he, um, uh, we'll, we'll just say, um, the, the offensive way to say it is that, um, behind every slip there's a skirt, <laughs> but, uh, that was, that was kind of, the, give you a hint, but it's a case one. <laughs> but, um, I know that's offensive. I, I wish there was a, a, a male version, maybe Meredith knows <laughs> a male version of that, but, um, but yeah, he, he got into a, a bad relationship and, um, was not healthy. Um, to say the least. And, um, what time is it? How much time I got? Um, any questions? Okay. <laughs> you want to know how to have one? Um, so we carried the message, you know, so one of the first people we, we, we got, me and Russ got, um, was this tall guy, this tall kid, and he had like a tattoo on his head. And we met him at an East Cop group, which if you've been there, you know, um, it scared the crap out of all those people. And they were like, ah. <laughs> and his, he was the sweetest kid in the world. His name was Justin. And, um, and me and, me and Russ were like, we're right on him. You know, it's like everybody's running and you got right on him. And, um, uh, the second we agreed to meet with him again and, and the second meeting, you know, Russ is like, um, goes, do you have a big book? He's like, no. And he gives him, but Russ goes and buys him the book and, and he comes out with this book and we're smoking a cigarette and he gives it to him. And, um, I go back, back inside and, um, he comes back, um, uh, a few minutes later, Justin comes into the meeting and he's got this wad of paper like that he's that he's carrying with him and um and uh I'm like looking at Russ I'm like what the hell is this and he and he, Russ is just starts laughing hysterically and um I'm like what the hell happened and he goes um 
I told them, you know, so that they wouldn't see the Alcoholics Anonymous to tear the cover off, to take, the, and he meant the paper cover on the hardback. And he, this kid had tore the entire hardback, <laughs> hardback cover off the book. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, I looked at, I, I looked at Russ and I was like, this guy's gonna make it, you know. <laughs> Cause, because he's willing to do any crazy thing that we tell him. <laughs> so, so, uh, and he did, and he, and he was like, he had one of our experiences too, you know, and, um, he was, um, he's one of the, those guys that, those rare cats that you sponsor, and they just do everything you ask them to do, and they just, they just show you what, what the power of the program is. Um, and, um, I ran into, um, uh, I guess since I have time, um, so, I mean, I ended up going back to school. I lived with Russ for a few years. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, uh, would, um, would go and pull sponsees together and, and, and whatnot. And I, I started going, I went back to school, I started working two jobs and things just started to, um, you know, get, get busy and Russ got a new girlfriend. So I got moved out. I moved out and I got a new girlfriend. And so like my program really slowed down. Um, and, uh, we, we weren't really talking too much. And then Russ told me, you know, he wasn't doing this. Um, he wasn't going to stay in AA anymore or he wasn't in AA anymore pretty much. And, um, and, uh, I just kept staying busy. Um, you know, Part of my, my, my only solace for a while was, was like speaker tapes. Um, there weren't a whole lot of people who could, I could relate to in the rooms who could relate to my experience. Um, and, um, and then around, I don't know, about 2008, maybe, um, 2010, um, folks started getting the internet <laughs> and started listening to Joe and Charlie. And then I started to hear things and I wasn't the only one, you know, I mean, there were other people. There was like Pedro, um, who ran the extension. Um, and I remember like Pedro would get attacked at meetings and I go, how do you put up with this stuff? And he's like, opinions are like assholes. <laughs> Everyone's got them, you know? And, um, it was hard to deal with, um, AA because it was like, you're the only one, you're the only one who's awake and everybody else is asleep and you go in there and you try to help people. Hey, you should work these steps and you get five people share behind you and say, you know, I don't want, don't worry about those steps, you know, just go to a lot of meetings. And five people say that and one person says, work the steps. What do you think you're going to do? And it's, it was, you know, it was kind of difficult. Um, so, you know, and I got frustrated with, with AA. And like I said, the only thing that was like my only solace was like speaker tapes and I would do online meetings and I would troll <laughs> and I would argue with people online about AA and, 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 it was just like I got really sick around 10 years and, and I just, the world became arid, as I say. Um, and I listened to a talk by uh, Tom Brady Jr. to talk about um, emotional sobriety as a phase of recovery that affects people who have long-term sobriety. And I felt like I was going through that. And it was hard to talk to, to Dave because we were kind of growing apart. Um, and uh, he had moved like out of the country. Um, and, um, it was really hard to get in touch with him. And, um, I was like, I, I need to just kind of just start over and get a new sponsor, a new direction. And I thought I just needed somebody that was just completely opposite. <laughs> I actually was going to, I was thinking about like getting like a, like a Christian sponsor, like somebody who was like <laughs> really, really in the, in the Jesus and stuff, just cause I, I needed something that was just not me, you know, kind of thing, just. It wasn't the way I thought, kind of, because the way I was thinking was just making me miserable, and so I needed somebody just who could think differently for me. And um, I looked for a few months, um, and um, um, I kind of forced—I had to force myself to go to AA meetings. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I mean, I really did. I mean, because I was really like wanted to just go, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. And, <laughs> and I really just had to like recenter myself and, um, start going to AA and just become like, I had to like, feel like I had to start over again and just like, um, really had to make this like more, I had to rededicate myself and make this a way of life. And, um, I had gotten married a, um, a few years before and things were really starting to struggle with that. And, I was like, you know, I need to throw myself into helping others. Um, I was pulling sponsees and I'd take them through the steps and then I'd lose contact with them as soon as I got them. You know, some of them would have spiritual experiences and I'd 
I'm like, all right, go find a real sponsor. <laughs> like I got what I wanted, <laughs> you know? And, um, and I was like, I need, I need, you know, to keep people in my life and recovery. Um, because it's just like, I was kind of just like using the rooms. I didn't have a home group, but I didn't have any of that stuff. And, um, I just knew that I wasn't going to stay sober. Um, and so I, I was like, but I felt like if I didn't stay sober, and again, my ego saved me. <laughs> I felt like if I didn't stay sober, then nobody would know how to do inventory ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and so the inventory expert came back. <laughs> no. Um, um, so I kind of just listened to people in the rooms for a while. And I just, um, it was, it was at that point I was going to a meeting every day. And it was the end of the month, and you know, like every meeting has a ding speaker at the end. At every, so it's like the worst time to hit meetings is like the end of the month because you're in every speaker whenever you want to hear a, a bunch of people talk and stuff. So I'd hit like three speaker meetings, and then Jerry's, and I was like, I'm already up here, so I'll hit my fourth one in a row. And I heard Jerry's story, and um, Bob Darrell is a big. Uh, I've listened to a lot of. Obviously, I've listened to a lot of his stuff and, over the years, and and I was like. Yeah, that's 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 the guy, and so I asked Jerry to sponsor me. And um, what was great about that is like he, um, we're not that different, I don't think. But um, um, he grounded me in in a fellowship. He gave me a home base. Um, uh, I feel like I have a tent hole with uh, primary purpose. Um, I feel like I have an obligation to be there every week, and that's what I needed most. Um, I needed structure. Um, somebody that I could run things by, um, you know, as far as, uh, working with others. Um, and I think that our sponsor, you know, our relationship has, uh, grown over the years. Um, we've grown closer, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, he doesn't know how to do inventory, but no. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. There's no wrong way to do it. <laughs> yeah, there's just more effective ways, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but um, I'll let y'all go early. <laughs> Is it early? Ah, it's right on time. But, yeah, I mean, um, I'm on more, I, you know, I do a heck of a lot more work um, in the in a now that I ever did before, and my life is I'm so much happier um, with who I am as a person and what I'm doing. We just did a, um, a workshop, um, me and Drew and, and John, and, and it's just been um, you know my things. I'm making okay money. You know, I'm not. Yeah, that's probably going to have to get better, <laughs> but it allows me to do a lot of work. Um, in AA, uh, just not being, having a stressful job. Um, and, um, uh, I, you know, like I said, I, I just, I, uh, I love AA now, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I still have enemies. I still have, um, people that, that, that don't, don't like me and I don't like them. And it's, it's great. And <laughs> but, um, you know, I have friends now. I have people that I can rely on. I have people that I can talk to about, um, issue, real issues in my life and, and, um, you know, uh, things that I really, you know, struggle with. Um, and, um, um, it's, I'm glad that, um, I was right about it. <laughs> I was kidding. I'm glad that, you know, the steps became popular again in AA. I mean, if, if that's probably the one thing that saved my life was that there were people in who I could start to relate to, um, in the rooms so or people like, um, that, I couldn't, you know, I, I would go in there and talk and I, you know, we talk, you get attacked by people because they really try and they think they're doing the best thing for people. Like don't tell them about God and steps, you know, cause they'll run and they really thought that was the best thing to do. Um, and I'm glad that that's not the case anymore. People understand, you know, this is a 12 step program and, um, people who do the steps get better and people who don't, don't. And that's what most AAs understand today. And I think that that's a huge step from where we were. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, and I hope that it continues and, um, the internet stays around and people start listening to those, uh, that, uh, those book studies and stuff. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I always tell people you become a black belt. And the reason why I do that, and I'll close with this, 
become a black belt because what that means is um, there's a guy who t- tells a story. He loved kung fu growing up when he was a kid. He loved watching kung fu movies, and so he decided he wanted to be like a black belt. And he, so he goes to karate school, and um, and um, he you know trains for three years in his karate school, and he finally tests to be a black belt. And he passed, you know, and he passes, and he goes to his first class as a black belt. And the, um, the, he goes up to the sense, well, his very first lesson was this exact same first lesson he learned as a white belt. It was the same exact lesson. And he runs up to the sensei after the meeting, and he says, sensei, what, I thought I was going to learn how to break boards and, and rip out throats and stuff, and, um, what the heck, man? <laughs> and he's like, um, do you know what a black belt is? And he's like, I guess I don't. He says, all a black belt is is someone who has mastered the basics. And so my advice is become a black belt. You know, you know, if you're taking people through the 12 and 12, well, you're wrong. <laughs> um, there's a better way. <laughs> but um, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.